Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. I'm doing great because today we are gonna talk about one of the great people of country music. We are in Nashville today and we are headed to the Hermitage Gardens Cemetery and we're gonna talk about Ernest Tubb. Now, if you've been watching me, you A, not only remember just a few vlogs ago that we were at Ernest Tubbs record shop, his historic record shop that had been open since 1947. We were talking about how it announced that the building was being sold. It has since closed. Last week, they had their official last jamboree night. They celebrated their anniversary and on the night of their anniversary, they closed the doors for good. Uh, unless somebody else buys it and reopens it and goes through all that, it's, it's gone. But Ernest Tubb was beloved in this town and I wanna pay him his due respect. The Texas Troubadour, Ernest Tubb. Hope you guys enjoy today's vlog. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. This is not one of those cemeteries where there are a ton of country music artists where, you know, everybody comes to. It's not like a celebrity cemetery. Nice and dignified, quiet. Ernest is here. Let's go visit him. I thought since we were just in Mississippi vlogging Jimmy Rogers, Ernest Tubb has a huge tie in to Jimmy Rogers. I just thought this would be a really good time for people that had just seen that vlog to, to see this one. It says we're looking for section A. So to find Ernest, you're gonna go around the circle over here and then you're gonna find the Garden of Peace. And he's basically straight down. There's a road right where those houses are that goes along the side of the cemetery. He's right down there. You'll see a little bush. You know, it's kind of funny. Every time I do a cemetery video, somebody complains, you have no respect. You're walking over graves. Well, when people come out here looking for their loved ones, they're walking over graves. I mean, when they mow the lawn out here, they're walking over graves. I don't think anybody's feeling disrespected. I certainly don't mean any disrespect by it. It's the thought that counts. So you'll see a little bush down here right before there. So you see that bush right over there? It's the only one over there. Ernest is right here. His son is right over here. Ernest's wife, Oline. Wow. Ernest Tubb. The Ernest Tubb. Wow. Cherished husband, daddy, and granddaddy. Married June 3rd, 1949. Sorry, I'm trying to keep my shadow out of this. Oline Adams, boy is there a story to how he met her. Kind of a funny one. We'll read all the well wishes from their kids after. Ernest Tubb is so interesting to me. He was born in a small town in Texas, Crisp, Texas. His parents were sharecroppers and they expected him to be a sharecropper as well. So he was a farmer as a kid taking care of animals and everything. And he all of a sudden one day heard Jimmy Rogers. Now, since we just went out and visited Jimmy Rogers grave and we just went to the Jimmy Rogers museum and hometown and everything, I thought, you know, we gotta come and tie it into Ernest so it's all fresh to everybody. Ernest became a huge fan of Jimmy, started learning how to sing just like him, would write songs. Without even being able to play an instrument, he would write songs about Jimmy and basically just started to idolize him. And in 1933, he ended up moving to San Antonio, getting a guitar, and started really taking up playing trying to do it for a career, but he sounded just like Jimmy Rogers. Well, living in San Antonio, he worked at a pharmacy by the day and got himself on a radio show. He would do two 15 minute spots a week locally doing country music or doing his kind of music, which he would become famous for because he would do a, be the first one to bring like Texas country to Nashville, like Texas swing. And so anyway, Ernest goes to San Antonio and he ends up marrying his next door neighbor. He lived in an apartment building, fell in love with his neighbor, Elaine. They got married. Then all of a sudden he realizes, hey, Jimmy Rogers' widow lives here in San Antonio. I wanna get a picture of Jimmy. Now what's interesting is that Ernest 
idolizing Jimmy his whole life had actually had a moment where he was going to be able to meet Jimmy and he ended up backing out of it because he was afraid that it might end up being a letdown. Can you imagine being put in the position of getting to meet your idol and then deciding not to because you, you're afraid it's going to be a letdown and then him dying within weeks afterward? So he ended up looking up Jimmy's widow, having a conversation on the phone with her and then she invited him out to the house and out there he played her some of his music, told her about his radio show, she gave him a picture of Jimmy which is what he wanted and she even showed him Jimmy's guitar, one of Jimmy's Martin guitars and let him play it and he said that was actually like maybe one of the best days of his life because from there she started listening to the radio show and about three months later she contacted him and said, you know what, I think you're worthy of my help. And so she decided to call some people in the record business she knew. She got him a record deal, got him some local public appearances all over the southern Texas area, and then ended up getting him a sponsorship by a flower company. So he'd go ride around on a flower truck through town. They'd be like making announcements and promotions and everything through the truck, and then he'd get off at each town for 15 minutes and play some songs and talk about the flower and ended up doing this for quite a few years making his rounds all over Texas playing music. Now the problem was that he sounded just like Jimmy Rogers and when you already had one Jimmy Rogers you didn't need another so that was a problem. He started working on some new songs and some new sound and even Jimmy's widow said, you gotta find a new sound. Well, he ended up needing a tonsillectomy. And when he went to meet with the doctor, he said, hey, this isn't gonna affect my singing voice, is it? And the guy says, no, it'll, after a couple of weeks, you'll be fine, you'll be back to sounding exactly the same, but he didn't. After he had it, it dropped his voice and he was so mad that he wanted to go and like beat up and sue the <laughs> doctor. But in the end, it changed his voice, dropped his voice low enough to where he didn't sound like Jimmy anymore and actually, made him sounding more distinct. So he said, after that, I wanted to go write the guy a check. Now he had a hit song eventually in 1940, finally, after many years of trying to get somewhere, started making some headway with a song called I'm Walking the Floor Over You. And he pretty much loved playing that song till the rest for the rest of his performances. And uh, that became a hit that got him in a couple of movies. And then he got invited to go play the Opry. And at that time, Opry was more like banjos and ukuleles and all that kind of stuff. And they didn't ever have anybody electric. And Ernest was like a cowboy and he was playing with an electric guitar because, see, he had been told by jukebox owners, hey, Ernest, we don't play your music and we don't put it in our jukebox because you, it's voice and two acoustic guitars. At night when people are talking and, and bustling around, they can't hear those and we don't play them. So he started incorporating an electric guitar into the band sound. And so he, when he was gonna play the opera, he said, hey, look, my sound on the records and live is I play with an electric guitar, you know? And he said, well, we don't really like it, but if you want to, go ahead. So he did, and they were just absolutely blown away by him. Like they almost couldn't get him off the stage. The fans went crazy. He was unlike anyone they'd seen before. He was, you know, all decked out in Western clothes and was very appreciative, like always smiled, like great stage presence. He wasn't just like a singer. This guy really like roped you in with his personality on stage. Now, Ernest loved a tour. He was married for over a decade, but that was probably because he wasn't home. And that's also why it ended because he just wasn't there to give enough time. He just loved being on the road. He loved performing and he loved performing in front of people. And when, you know, back in those days, everybody was using like cars and whatever to go around and do these tours. So they couldn't go very far. He was one of the first in country music to start using a tour bus so that he could go further distances. And the whole band would live on the tour bus together and have that camaraderie where they would play the show afterward, play cards all night, drink, hang out. Like in those days, like people in country music said that was like part of the experience. That was part of the bonding of like, you wanted to be in that situation. Now, Ernest's tour bus, he actually had four of them throughout his career. One of them is inside of a closed vintage store right now. And I'm working on getting us in there while I'm in Nashville so I can show you guys. But it's important because, you know, that, that was the camaraderie of the band. And when you got, when you joined the Texas Troubadours, you got a belt buckle that really like let everybody in town know that you were somebody. You were, you were a great musician because you were playing with Ernest Tubb. Now, when they were on those trips, 
if Ernest was having any kind of feeling where like he felt like he had pressure musically or like from the fans, like he, he needed to give back to the fans or whatever, anytime he felt pressure, he would drink. And those were his two bad habits were drinking and smoking. And they said he was the nicest guy you could ever meet. But when he drank, he had a really bad habit of if he was dealing with a problem internally and that's what made him drink, because he didn't drink all the time. He may, you know, he might even go months without drinking and then just drink constantly for a couple of weeks. If something upset him to where he was thinking about it, once he got drunk, he would criticize everyone around him. He would pick apart everything in their life and tell them all the things they needed to change and everything that they were doing wrong. And one night he started doing this to his guitar player. And he said, you need to do this and you need to do that. And the guitar player stopped him and said, Ernest, I can take care of the problems in my life. You got a big old problem in your life that you can't take care of. And everything got quiet. Ernest said, when we get back to Nashville, you're fired. The guitar player said, you don't have to wait till Nashville. You can fire me right now. Ernest yelled, stop the bus. They stopped the bus and let him out. A couple weeks later, when they came back to Nashville, they all made amends again. And Ernest called the whole band together and said, as God is my witness, I'm not going to drink ever again. He didn't like the way that people saw him when he was drunk. He didn't like knowing that people thought of him that way. And he never did drink again. Now, Ernest and his wife had two kids, so she was taking care of the kids. But then Ernest decided he needed to open a record shop. He was the first country music star to open an independent record store. And she ended up basically running that. So that's, that's also kind of what kept their marriage together was that they were both always busy. It was basically that fans were coming to his shows and saying, I love your music and I love coming out and seeing you, but I can't find your records in stores. How do I get your records? And he realized if they were having that problem with him, they were probably having that problem with other country music and bluegrass stars. So that was the whole purpose behind doing the uh, record store because originally it was mainly mail order and that people could order stuff and they would ship it out. And problem was they were selling 78s then and those were pretty heavy, but they were brittle and br would break because of their size. So they were constantly having to return stuff and uh, it was costing a lot of money. So Ernest, luckily, like that was when that started in 1947 and eventually the entire, you know, record store would outlast Ernest's life. And like I said, at the beginning of the video, it just closed um, last week, actually. Ernest performed darn near everywhere you could until he physically just couldn't. Sadly, he had been a smoker his whole life and he had been told to stop numerous times and he just wouldn't stop. He loved to smoke and he ended up with emphysema and even when he had emphysema, he would still smoke. And then eventually he quit smoking because he would be coughing so bad while he was trying to sleep that he couldn't sleep. So he had to eventually give that up. But that was eventually what led to his death. He performed basically from 1933 when he really started writing music publicly he started to be performed from 1933 until 1982 and then the last two years of his life he was in pretty bad shape in fact he wouldn't even allow people to come visit him after a while because he had gotten so thin and so frail he just didn't want anybody to see him that way now you notice his family has put a lot on here so let me read some of it to you. It says, his gift for songwriting, talent for entertaining, and love for the country music paved the path from his birthplace in Crisp, Texas to Nashville, Tennessee. His popularity spreads to Hollywood Western movie roles, entertaining US troops in Korea, taping his popular syndicated TV series, The Ernest Tubb Show, and promoting artists on famous Midnight Jamboree broadcasts from the Ernest Tubb record shop every Saturday night. For over 40 years, he remained faithful to as many fans and fellow entertainers as he never turned anyone away who waited for a word, a photo, or an autograph. The million-selling recording of I'm Walking the Floor Over You became Ernest Tubb theme as he walked across many stages, many nights, and many places all over the world. Member of the Grand Ole Opry from 1943 to 1984, First headliner of an all-country show to perform at New York's Carnegie Hall in 1947. Founding member of the CMA Board of Directors, it's a Country Music Association. Elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame in 1965. Elected to the National Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1970. Honored with an Academy of Country Music Pioneer Award in 1981. 
said the twinkle in his eye remained long after tipping his white Stetson hat and flipping his guitar to show thanks to his fans in Berlin, Ohio, which was his last public performance on November 13th, 1982. Ernest Tubb was a legend. His legacy lives on through his music and the many lives he touched as he unselfishly extended a helping hand to his fellow entertainers and his fellow man. His gift to country music will always be remembered. No one will ever fill his boots. Honest to God, we could talk about Ernest Tubb all day and never run out of great stories and never quit liking him. But gosh darn it, let's have one more reason to like him. During the Korean War, he decided to go off and perform for troops. And he would not just sign autographs for them, but they would tell him, hey, can you deliver a message to my wife? And many times he would have them write down a message put it in his briefcase and then when he came home back to the US he would spend his time making phone calls and writing letters and filling in the girlfriends and the wives of the men fighting and letting them know that he had visited their husband and that they, they were doing well and that they wanted him to pass along that to them. How cool is that? You know there were stories from his band members saying a lot of times they'd show up in towns to perform and people would knock on the bus door and say, I don't have the money to see the show, but can I meet Ernest? His music means so much to me. And Ernest would either let them in the back door for free, or in one case, he gave a guy $200. He said, here you go, help this, use this to get back up on your feet. And a year or so later, there's a knock on the door of the bus. And that guy came back and paid Ernest back. Ernest looked out the door and he said, are those two girls out there yours? He said, yeah, he said, they look like they could use some nice new dresses. Why don't you take this money back and buy them some nice dresses? And on the one over here beneath Olean, the plaque is, it has a quote from all of their kids. He had two kids with Elaine, and then he had five kids with Olean. Now let's talk about Olean, because Ernest ends up getting a divorce, and then within a year, 1948 he had just divorced Elaine and now he's met Olean. Now the way he met her was she called into Ernest Tubb record shop and was looking for some sheet music and they got to talking on the phone. Next thing you know he was out driving down to her house and visiting her that day. And that's kind of funny because you know I said Ernest Tubb is one of the most beloved men in this business in country music because he loved people and he loved his fans. He knew that without his fans, like he, he wouldn't have had anything. He would have been a sharecropper. So uh, I had actually made a couple of friends that told me, hey, when I was a kid, I went to Ernest Tubb Record Shop and actually met him. Either somebody would say they met him inside or they met him on the so sidewalk out front. And then when I post videos mentioning Ernest Tubb, people would comment there and say, oh, when I was a kid, I went to the record shop and I met him there too. So he was always there. He was pretty easy to find and he believed when he played concerts, he said, if you paid to come out and see me and you bought a ticket or you bought my records, I owe you my autograph if you want it. So he would come out after every show and sit a chair at the edge of the stage and he would sign autographs for people and just really take in the fans. And he would also be pretty famous for helping people out because you see, when he got all that help from Jimmy Rogers' widow, the only thing she said eventually when he said, what can I ever do for you for giving me a career? She said, the only thing I want in return is for you to help somebody else. So if he saw someone that had talent when he was on the Opry, if he saw them performing that night, he would immediately say, hey, you come over and perform at the Jamboree and we'll get you some more attention, get you some publicity. And he just wanted to help people out a lot. He, he loved taking people under his wing and just a good guy all around. Really beloved in Nashville for doing things like that. One of the really cool things about Jimmy Rogers' widow was that she ended up giving Ernest Tubb Jimmy's guitar, that guitar that she showed him that day with his name across the fretboard. She ended up giving that to Ernest and Ernest would play that his entire career. And then when we were at Jimmy's museum, they normally have it, but they have it on loan right now at the Birthplace of Country Museum. So we're gonna try and get there while we're out and about in the next couple of weeks. Now just above their grave is their daughter, Olene. It's crazy. 
They, when he was married to Elaine, they named one of their kids Elaine. When he's married to Elaine, named one of the kids Elaine and Ernest Jr. And then over here is Justin, his first son, Justin Tubb. Traveling singing man. And his wife, who has not passed. And hopefully we can get in that tour bus while we're here. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed today's vlog. If you couldn't get enough and you want to know a little bit more, go watch the vlog I did a few weeks ago and see Ernest Tub Record Shop when it was still open, when there was still life. And uh, otherwise, go watch some of his videos on YouTube. Listen to the music. Enjoy yourself. Man was amazing. And after this, I think you can definitely have a lot of respect for him in your heart. If you're a first time viewer, please hit the subscribe button and please hit the like. Also the bell for notifications. Have a great night everyone, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Make a